Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's good to see so many of you here. My name is uh, Sven Beckert, and I'm delighted to be able to welcome you here today in my role as the co-chair of the program on the study of capitalism here at Harvard, and also as a faculty associate of the Center for European Studies. I would also like to welcome you in the name of Chigosh Ekiat, who is the director of the Center for European Studies, and uh, Chris Dizon, uh, who is sitting right here, who is the co-director of the program on the study of capitalism. It is great uh, to see so many of you here. I know many who would have liked to be here weren't able uh, to join us, but I'm particularly uh, honored to be able to welcome Professor Thomas Piketty to, as our speaker this afternoon. The program on the history of capitalism started more than 10 years ago here at Harvard, and when it started, an event like this seemed almost unimaginable. We had hoped to make, the, 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 we had hoped to make more central matters of capitalism to debates in history and to bring other disciplines, including economics, into a broad discussion on the history and the present day state of capitalism. And at first, such hope, hope seemed uh, truly futile. Our first seminars attracted very few students. And when I began to lecture on the history of capitalism, many well-meaning colleagues advised me that very few students would be interested in such an old-fashioned topic. Things turned out to be quite differently. And the study of capitalism has not only become extremely popular here at Harvard, but has become one of the most hotly debated topics in contemporary culture, with even Pope Francis and the Queen chiming in on such debates. But no one has made the problem of capitalism more intriguing, more intellectually alive, and more urgent than today's guest, Thomas Piketty. When in the late summer of 2013, Professor Piketty published his 800-page Opus Magnus in Paris. Few would have predicted that it would become a global bestseller. After all, here was a book that was chock full of tables and charts dealing with decidedly yawn-inducing topics such as the history of taxation, a book that moreover carried a decisively unsexy title, namely Capital in the 21st Century. And it was written in French. <laughs> Few would have predicted that 18 months later, the reading of that very book would at least lead one American CEO, Mark Bettolini of the Aetna Insurance Company, to raise the wages of his lowest paid workers, and that the press would come to compare its author to a rock star. Very few can claim that their writings have had such an immediate impact in, in the world and it's a testament not just to the brilliance of Pro Professor Piketty's research, but also to his ability to communicate th that research to a wider public that capital in the 21st century has fertilized political debate and has brought issues of the distributional effects of capitalism on the political agenda in many different parts of the world, including the United States. And of course, the book's success is also a sign of our own times. Thomas Piketty is a professor of economics at the Paris School of Economics and at the École des Hautes d'Études en Sciences Sociales. He's the author of numerous articles and books focusing on the interplay between economic development and the distribution of income and wealth over the long durée. With a degree from the École Normale Supérieure, he entered a PhD program at the École des Hautes d'Études and the London School of Economics, and in 1993, he defended his doctoral dissertation on wealth redistribution, a thesis that won the French Economic Association's prize for the best thesis of that year. Since then, he has taught at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in this fair city, and worked as a researcher for the French National Center for Scientific Research. Most, re most recently, he has led the creation of a massive database on world top incomes, which turned into the foundation for capital in the 21st century. That book has now sold more than 1.5 million copies, and it has become the most widely reviewed and discussed book of last year, sometimes in confusingly contradictory manner, such as when the decisively anti-Marxist journal The Economist called Professor Piketty the modern Marx, 
while self-identified Marxist David Harvey chided him for not being a Marxist at all, and in another journal, the American conservative called him the anti-Marx. <laughs> Beyond these confusions, Piketty's work has been of overwhelming importance to reigniting discussions on the distributional effects of capitalist development. The question of who gets what and how that has changed over the past 200 years. In the course of providing powerful sets of data in interpreting them, Professor Piketty has created a new space for discussing inequality and possible political responses to that inequality. In some ways, one could argue that his most important contribution has been to allow us to think again about the future. The future not as an inescapable neoliberal fate that we must adjust to as best as we can, but instead as something that we can mold and shape politically. While his reading of the history of capitalism is often a dark one, his reading of the political possibilities of the human condition is deeply optimistic. Not only does he provide political ideas on how to address sharpening inequality, but he also gives us the mental space to allow us to think again about the possibilities for alternative futures. Economic outcomes, he tells us, are fundamentally political outcomes, and he encourages us to think not just about the realm of necess necessity, but also about the realm of democratic possibility. Almost every commentator has justly emphasized Professor Piketty's contributions to the understanding of the long history of inequality. But the pages of his beautifully written book contain another contribution, hiding in plain sight, that is nearly as important and that I, as a historian, appreciate <coughs> in particular. He helps rescue thinking about the economy from the monopoly of economists. <laughs> Professor Piketty reaches out to other disciplines and especially to the discipline of history, and one can clearly see the influence of such towering voices as Fernand Brodel and Marc Bloch. His is not a past of immutable laws of development, but a past that is political, a past that is contingent, a, and a past that is embedded in cultural and social change. The Trente Glorieux, for example, are not the result of immutable economic laws, but the result of a confluence of political factors and events. And thus, Professor Piketty's work is grounds for optimism for yet another reason, that we might be able to reignite a discussion on the economy, its past and its future, for, by bringing in the voices of historians, anthropologists, sociologists, and many others. Without much further ado, I would like to open the proceedings. Professor Piketty will speak for about 45 minutes, and he will then be followed by three very short five-minute responses from members of the Harvard faculty before we open up uh, the discussion to the floor. And let me just introduce quickly these three commentators uh, before we move on. David Kennedy, who will respond first, is the Hudson Professor of Law and Faculty Director of the Institute for Global Law and Policy at Harvard Law School where he teaches on international law, international economic policy, and also legal theory. He has published widely on international law and just recently published Global Governance, New Thinking About Law and Policy. He's also the mastermind behind the Institute for Global Law and Policy, a project that brings together people across many disciplines to think in new ways about globalization, its power, and its challenges. Stephen Marglin, who will speak next, holds the Borko Chair in the Department of Economics at Harvard University. His recent work focuses on the foundational assumptions of economics and how these assumptions make community invisible to economists. This work reflected in his book, The Dismal Science, how thinking like an economist undermines community, attempts to counter the aid and comfort these assumptions give to those who would construct the world in the image of economics a world ultimately a world without community. And last but not least, you will hear from Christine Dizan, who's not only the co-sponsor of the program on the history of capitalism here at Harvard, but also and perhaps even mainly the godly professor of law at Harvard Law School. Her work centers on the institutional underpinnings of capitalism so that we can open them up to revision. She's in she in particular explores the history of money as a legal and political project 
and just published Making Money, Coin Currency, The Coming of Capitalism, a book that decodes the monetary architecture of capitalism. Thank you again for joining us, and thank you again, Professor Piketty, for being with us today. Professor Piketty. Thank you, thank you, Sven, and, and uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. I'm, I'm sorry that my English uh, sounds a lot like French, but uh, <laughs> I hope you can understand me. I'm, I'm very glad to be here in, in Cambridge, and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the, the book, my book first came out in French, and it came out in English shortly after that. And you know, now it has been translated in many languages, and you know, out, out of the about 1.5 million copies. I guess there's about 500,000 in the English language, 500,000 in European uh, language, uh, French, uh, Italian, German, and about the same 500,000 in, uh, in Asia, in, in Japanese and, and Chinese. But I think the English version played a particular role. And you know, I would really like to, to, to pay tribute to Arthur Goldhammer, who is right there, you know, in the first rank. And You know, there's no way I could have written such a beautiful uh, English and such a beautiful book in English. You know, my, my, as you can see, my English, you know, I'm not particularly good with foreign language. I do what I can. And, you know, my written French is much, much better than my written English. And there's no way I could have referred to uh, the literature to, or to express myself with the same clarity that the uh, art was able to do by uh, translating my book into English. So I think this has been really, uh, you know, it's more than a translator, I guess, translation is always more than translation and of course there's no other language for which I can I am able to check that the translation was so good so uh, but uh, so thanks a lot art uh, so le let me uh, you know in, in this presentation I'm going to try to present some of the results of the book and reflect about some of the debate also that uh, 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 you know this book has um, has stimulated over the past uh, year or so. So let me let me first say, you know, very quickly that this book uh, comes from a very collective uh, project of data collection. So I am trying in this book to put the study uh, of the distribution uh, back at the center of, of political economy and of the social sciences uh, 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 more generally. Uh, but primarily what I have been doing in my research is to collect a lot of historical data on income and wealth. And this is something that I could never have done uh, without uh, several dozens of COSARs from over 20 countries. So in particular, you know, I, I started collecting data on income and wealth in France about 15 years ago. And then I was very fortunate to meet uh, Tony Atkinson, Emmanuel Saez, uh, Gilles Postel-Vinet, Jean-Laurent Rosenthal, Facundo Alvaredo, Gabriel Zuckman, and many others, which you know, I cannot quote everybody here, but it's clear that you know, there is no way I would have been able to collect all this data by myself. And this is an ongoing process. And, uh, and, and, and so, you know, the book is just a photography of, uh, of what, you know, the kind of historical material we had at one point in time. But, you know, there will be more um, uh, data collection and more uh, um, uh, uh, historical material uh, uh, available in the, in the future. So, you know, we, thanks to this data collection, we know a little bit more than what we used to, but, you know, we still know too little. And uh, in particular, you know, there's, a, uh, 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 you know, there's absolutely no problem in my mind if people disagree with some of the historical interpretations that I give for the patterns that I find. We are in the social sciences. There are different ways to interpret uh, historical evolution. And, and so the objective of the book is not to say, OK, this is the one way, the one law to interpret uh, history. You know, of course, when you look at the evolution of income and wealth distribution over more than 20 countries across three centuries, there cannot be just one law or one principle. There are many different institutions, policies, social, cultural, political processes that play a role. And I'm trying to illuminate some of them 
in the book, but you know this is just a, uh, uh, this is just a beginning, and, and there is a lot more to do in, in this area. So in, in this presentation, I'm going to present some results from mostly from part two and three in the book, so as to give you a sense of the material. You can have, you know, if you go to this website, you will find all the graphs and series, and, and uh, you will have a better sense of, of what you know what material is included in the in the book. Uh, so. In this presentation, I'm going to focus on the, these three points. I will start with the first point, which is about the long-run dynamics of income inequality. And then I will move to wealth. And to a large extent, what my book is trying to do is to shift the attention from uh, the issue of income distribution to the issue of wealth and property uh, concentration. But I will start with income inequality. I will show you a number of results about the long run dynamics of income inequality. And some of the main conclusions will be the end of the Kuznets curve, the end of universal law, and the idea that country specific institutions and policy uh, you know, are absolutely critical if you want to understand the long run evolution of income inequality in the various countries. Then, point two will be about what I call the return of a patrimonial or wealth based societies, particularly in Europe and Japan, where wealth income ratio seem to be returning to very high levels uh, in those countries. And I will, I will stress also the metamorphosis of capital, the transformation of the different forms of property, which raise new uh, challenges uh, for the future. And the third point will be about the future of wealth concentration and, and uh, concentration of property. And I will argue that one of the important forces certainly not the only one, but one of the important forces uh, uh, for understanding the future of wealth concentration is the gap between R and G, the R, where R is the net of tax rate of return, particularly for large wealth portfolio, and G is the growth rate. And to the extent that this will be higher uh, in the future than what it was in the past, this might contribute to rising uh, inequality. Uh, so le let me start with the first point, you know, about the long run dynamics of income inequality. So a, a big part of the data on income inequality that I present in the book comes from this database, the World Top Income Database. So you, you can't see the colors very well, but let me just say that the countries in red, well, say in black, uh, are already in the database, and the countries in blue, like Brazil or Algeria, are about to enter the database. So what it means to be in the database is that we try to collect all the historical data uh, on income that we have for a given country. So usually the oldest source of information on income comes from the income tax itself. So it's important to realize, but you all know this, that, that taxation is more than taxation. Taxation is also a way to produce information. It's a way to produce legal categories and statistical categories so that society can also accumulate knowledge about itself. And so when you don't have an income tax, you know, the income tax was created in 1913 in the United States, in 1914 in France, and uh, in, in uh, uh, a, bit, a little bit earlier in Japan and Germany, where it was created around 1880, 1890. Um, uh, in India, it was introduced uh, in 1922 by the British colonizer. So almost everywhere between 1900 and 1920, you have the creation of the modern income tax. And and this creates also a source of information about income. Of course, that's not a perfect source of information, but it's better than no information at all. So in the 19th century, you don't have an income tax in most countries. So like in France, you have uh, uh, the contribution des portes et fenêtres, the contribution on the number of doors and windows. So you have all sorts of beautiful statistics on the numbers of doors and windows. Uh, by department, which is quite interesting, by the way, and this is an historical data source that is certainly underused, but you know, it's less interesting in a way than, than income. And so this is true for, for income. This is also true for wealth. You know, the taxation of wealth, in particular the, the taxation of inherited wealth, transmission of wealth uh, uh, at the time of inheritance, is also a way to register property and to register wealth and to produce information about wealth. So uh, uh, the taxation of wealth, and in particular of inheritance, is much older than the taxation of income. 
because registering property is very important to organize society in general. So you have registration in property in very ancient societies. And in particular in France, it is, uh, uh, you know, with the French Revolution, you have the introduction with, of, uh, of an inheritance tax that was pretty universal for the time. And this is why we can go back uh, with fellow uh, historians, uh, Postel Villain and Rosenthal, to the French archives, to the late 18th century, to study the distribution of wealth in France starting in the late 18th century. Now, for income, we cannot do this, but we can start at least around 1900, 1910. And so we can, we can study the evolution of income inequality. I, I should mention that uh, one of the very positive uh, impact for me of the publication and the success of the book is that it allowed us to access uh, historical fiscal data and fiscal and current fiscal files in new countries where government were not so open. So now in, in, in Brazil, in Mexico, should be in blue on the map, in, in Taiwan, in Korea, in, in, in Chile, we are accessing uh, the, the historical income data uh, which we could not access before. And, and so, you know, there are more countries in particular that we try to, to cover in, in the emerging world, in Latin America, in Asia, also in Africa. We put a lot of energy are trying to use data for Africa. And, and uh, so, you know, the countries that are not covered in the book, it's not that we don't want to cover them. It's just that sometimes we had no access to the historical uh, sources and we now have more access uh, to them. Uh, so let me show you some examples of what we find in this database. Maybe, uh, you know, so let me present three facts about inequality in the long run. Uh, one about income inequality, and then I will show you about wealth inequality and finally about wealth income ratio. And if you want to have a short summary, you know, the, the book is very long and I should apologize for that. So if you want to have, you know, the good thing about science, you know, about real science and real scientific people is that they want short articles. So when we had to publish, this paper with my friend and colleague uh, Emmanuel Saez in science last year, this had to be five page long. So if you want a five page, <laughs> if you want a five page summary, you know, you can read this science article called Inequality in the Long Run and the, where you will have these three facts about inequality in the long run that are exposed in a very condensed manner. Well, I think you will lose some of it and in particular you will lose the beautiful translation of art, but, but <laughs> This will just be my English, so that's, uh, that's less interesting, but at least the basic facts will be presented in a very condensed manner. So fact number one. Fact number one is the following. In 1900, 1910, income inequality was higher in Europe than in the United States, whereas in 2000, 2010, it is a lot higher in the United States. So that's an interesting reversal of inequality in the long run because the way I will interpret this is that changing institutions, changing policies can make a difference. Okay, so it's not that some countries are always more unequal than others. You know, it depends how you organize yourself in a, in a country. There are different ways to organize capitalism, and, and there are different levels of inequality that go, that go with it. So let me show you one simple graph. So this is the share of income going to the top 10%. So you have Europe, the US. So Europe, as you know, is a complicated uh, continent, but here I am going to simplify things. I'm, I'm, so what I mean by Europe here is the GDP weighted average of Germany, France, Britain, Italy, Sweden. So it's not quite Europe, but it's a big part of Western Europe, at least. And, and the general evolutions are very similar for the different, at least, continental European countries. So le let's call it Europe for, to simplify. And as you can see, in fact, in all European countries, income inequality was higher in 1900-1910 than in the US, whereas today you can see so there was a big decline in inequality following uh, World War I and particularly World War II, the Great Depression. And in the 1950s, this is what Kuznets finds in his famous uh, study, inequality is less in the 1950s than in 1910. But uh, so all what we've did in this research is to extend the work of Kuznet to many more years and many more countries. And as you can see, this changes a lot the perspective because in the 50s, you could have this optimistic view of a decline and then stabilization of inequality at a lower level. Now in 2010, it's a very different uh, story because you've had this very big increase of the share of total income going to the top 10%, which in the US went from about one third to about almost one half. Okay, so when you go from one third to one half of total income going to the top 10, you know, this is just not just an issue of a few individuals 
getting very rich at the top, which after all, you know, nobody cares if it was just a few individuals. But here we are talking about significant uh, macroeconomic share in total income. Uh, so here it looks very smooth because I look at decennial averages. So everything looks very smooth, and that's convenient in order to focus on the, on the, on the long run pattern. If you look at annual series for the US, you can see that it is much less smooth. You know, in particular, if you take into account, so this is the same curve as before, except that I only show you the US and I look at annual series rather than decennial averages. And you can see in particular, because of capital gains, that the stock market Uh, uh, cycle has a strong impact on inequality. So you can see in the US uh, in 2007, you have a very high point in inequality. Now in 2008 and 2009, uh, this is clearly not a good time to, to exercise your capital gains and, and or to cash a big bonus. So, uh, so you have a decline in inequality. But then in 2012, you are even higher than 2007. So in 2012, you have uh, 51% going to the top. Uh, in 2013, it seems to be a little bit lower. Well, you know, anyway, you have short run variations, but, but if you take the long run picture, you know, it's pretty clear that you have a spectacular increase in the share of total income going to the top 10%. So if you just take the decennial averages and you compare to Europe, you know, I think you, you can see how big the difference between these two different group of, uh, of uh, uh, rich countries, well, the US on the one hand and European countries on the other hand, is. If you were to put Japan on the graph, this is what you would have. So Japan will be in between uh, Europe and the US, closer to Europe in many ways. So it's interesting to put uh, uh, US and Europe and Japan because these are like the three parts of the rich world. And uh, you can see that they are very different experience. So that's important because you know, sometimes people want to explain rising inequality just by talking about globalization. Okay, and the story will be, okay, you have globalization, you have China entering the world labor market. Therefore, this is putting a strong pressure on the wages of low-skilled workers. And this is what creates rising inequality. And I'm not saying this is not important. But I'm just saying that if this was the only explanation, then you should have the same rise in inequality everywhere. Because globalization happened not only in the US, but also in Japan and Europe. So you know, I, sometimes we have debates which are very much self-centered in the US, but also in Europe or in Japan. But I think it's important to look at other countries' experience and to realize that uh, globalization is important, but then there are different institutions, different policies that help to organize globalization and to allow broader groups of the population to benefit from globalization. Okay? So what are these policies that can make a difference? Well, I, you know, I try to analyze them in the book, but let me summarize very quickly. So the rise in US inequality in recent decades is mostly due to rising inequality of labor income. Also, rising concentration of capital income and wealth is starting to bump in at the end of the period. And a recent study by Saez and Zuckman uh, emphasizes this. But most of the action so far uh, comes from rising inequality of labor income. This is due to a mixture of reasons. You know, changing supply and demands for skills, rise between education and technology. Globalization certainly is part of the story. But I think there is more than that. You need to have a story where you have more unequal access to skills in the US uh, than in Europe or Japan. So maybe rising tuition, insufficient public investment in education, you know, that, that can explain why you have higher inequality in skill acquisition and access to education uh, in, in the US than in the rest of the rich world. Unprecedented rise of top managerial compensation in the US. So why, why did it happen so much in the US? You know, there's a complicated uh, changing social norms and also changing incentives and changing corporate governance. I tend to believe on the basis of my research with Emmanuel Saez and Stephen Stancheva that the very large cut in top income tax rates that have happened in the US since the 70s, 80s have also played a role and have, have transformed the incentives for very top managers to try to bargain very aggressively and try to get very high pay increase, which uh, are often difficult to explain on the basis of observed performance or observed productivity and have more to do with the ability 
to uh, some time, you know, to put the right people in the right compensation committee in order to get pay increase. Falling minimum wage in the US also played clearly a role. So, you know, I, I, I don't ask you to agree with the exact <coughs> importance of each explanation, but I think we can all agree about the fact that uh, education policy, uh, corporate governance, fiscal policy, labor market policy, all these different institutions matter and, and explain why you can have different rise in inequality in, in, in these different countries. Let, just let me show you, you know, the example of the minimum wage. So this is a graph that, that is taken from my book. So this is the real value of the minimum wage in France and the US. So you see that in the 50s, 60s, the minimum wage used to be a lot higher in the US than in France. Whereas today it is a lot smaller. So some people in France will say that it is uh, too high in France, which you know, I'm not going to comment on this. That's a reasonable discussion. But it is certainly too low in the US. Or at least, you know, in the US right now, the federal minimum wage is 7.2 or 7.3 dollars per hour. It used to be uh, 10 dollars uh, in the late 1960s. So it's quite unusual. So this is expressed in dollars of today. Uh, in 2013 dollars. Uh, so the purchasing power of the federal minimum wage in the US is today less than what it was in the 1960s at a time where there was no more unemployment than today. So it's quite unusual you know, in a country to have a decline in the real value of the minimum wage over a 50-year period, which, and, and clearly this change in labor market institution, change in, in collective bargaining, the role of unions also played a big role in the evolution of inequality. Let, let me show you another graph regarding education. So this is taken from a very interesting research by Raj Shetty, who teaches at Harvard Econ Department with uh, Emmanuel Saez, who is at Berkeley. So you have, on the horizontal axis, you have the parental income rank. So if you have 10, it means that you are in the bottom 10% of the family distribution of income in the US. And 90, you are in the top 10%. And this is your percentage uh, attending college at 1821. So you see, you get an almost perfect straight line and you know you go basically from zero to 100 percent. Okay, so if your parents are poor in this country, your probability to access higher education, you know, is a little more than 20 percent. And then if your parents are in the top 10 percent, it's 90 percent. So you don't go from zero to 100, but you go from 20 to 90 percent, which is you know almost as spectacular. I find this graph very striking. So this means that you know you have a uh, uh, you know you have a theoretical discourse about meritocracy, equal opportunity, access to higher education, and you have the reality. Okay, and and the reality uh, you know is a bit frightening. And and I also you know I'm, I'm not saying you know it's it's perfectly equal in other countries. You know I think there's a lot of hypocrisy and a lot of inequality in access to higher education everywhere. Certainly in my country, in France, with sometimes a lot of hypocrisy in the ability of public institutions to invest three times more in very elitist schools than in normal schools. But there is evidence that inequality in access to higher education is even higher in the US than in, in Europe or in, in Japan. And I give evidence for, for this in the book. So anyway, this is just to illustrate that education policy, access to education is very important, together with the minimum wage, together with progressive taxation. So it's a whole set of institutions and policies that, that matter. Now let me move to the second point of my uh, uh, lecture, which is about the return of patrimonial society. So, so far I have focused mostly on inequality of income, and in particular labor income. Now I want to move more to wealth. And, and, and capital, which is the, the main subject of the, of the book. So of course, inequality in wealth and capital ownership is, is partly determined by inequality of labor income, because if you have more unequal labor income, then you have more unequal resources to save and accumulate wealth and become owners of large piece of property. But the inequality of wealth is a more complicated object than the inequality of labor income, because it also involves inheritance it involves natural resources, which have been saved by no one. Uh, and, and the concentration of, of property is always a lot higher than the concentration of labor income, as I'm going to show you in a minute. So I'm going to make uh, first a point. You know, point number two of my presentation will be about the return of what I call a patrimonial or wealth-based society, uh, particularly in Europe and Japan, where I will show you that wealth income ratio seem to be returning to very high levels uh, in, in these countries. 
so what's particular in Europe and Japan is that you have very low uh, population growth, and indeed, in fact, negative population growth in Japan or in some European countries, and that's a very big difference in the, with the US. And the basic intuition is that in a slow growth society, wealth accumulated in the past can naturally become very important. And in the very long run, this can be relevant for the entire world, you know, to the extent that population growth will stop everywhere at some point. Uh, so, of course, if you have a lot of migration, you can keep growing. And, uh, you know, I know that, you know, this is a country uh, where migration is important, and in particular, universities would like uh, the, uh, all the rest of the planet to come here. But, you know, uh, once we, if we are all in the U.S., then that, that will not solve the problem in the long run. You still have, uh, you know, population growth uh, will depend on, on fertility and, you know, the projections we have so far is that population growth in the long run is going to be smaller than what it was in the past and possibly close to zero. So to the extent that there will be a slowdown uh, uh, for, for, uh, for uh, other parts of the planet than just Europe and Japan, this rise of wealth income ratio and this return of what I call a patrimonial society will be relevant. Um, in, in more countries. Now, this is not bad in itself, but this raises new challenges. And in particular, I will, I will argue that the metamorphosis of capital assets call for new forms of regulations, of property relations, and that this will be uh, very important issues in the future. And, and, and then I will move to point number three. So regarding point number two, let me first stress that uh, uh, wealth inequality is always a lot higher than income inequality. So let me show you uh, uh, you know, let me first describe two important facts. You know, fact number two. So remember, fact number one was that income inequality is now higher in the US than in Europe. Fact number two is that wealth inequality is always a lot higher than income inequality, and that it is also now higher in the US than in Europe. But fact number three, wealth inequality is still less extreme today than what it was a century ago in Europe, where it was really very extreme in spite of the fact that the total capitalization of private wealth relative to national income has now recovered from the World War shocks. So it's important to distinguish between inequality on the one hand and total quantity or total capitalization of wealth, which is not quite the same thing, uh, uh, on the other hand. Okay? So, so you can have the fact that you have a very high total capitalization of private wealth is not necessarily bad if you have a large middle class which owns a big part of total wealth. So the, it's important to distinguish the inequality on the one hand and the wealth income ratio uh, on, on the other hand. So if we look at inequality, so first look at the orders of magnitude. Uh, remember for income inequality, the top 10% share was between one third and one half. You know, it used to be one third in the US, it is now closer to one half. Now, for wealth inequality, it's always more than one half. You know, it goes between 60% to 90% in Europe uh, before World War I. So, wealth is a lot more concentrated than income. For, for many people, you know, the bottom 50% share in wealth is always less than 5%. So, there's a very large group in the population for whom, you know, the very notion of wealth or capital ownership is quite abstract. And, you know, many people just have, uh, you know, little, little savings on their accounts or they have a mortgage that is almost as big as their real estate property. So their net wealth is really uh, quite small. Uh, so whatever does not belong to the top 10% typically belongs to uh, the middle 40%, what I call in my book the patrimonial middle class, the people who are not in the bottom half and who are not in the top 10%. And so whatever does not belong to the top 10 on this graph belongs to, the, to, the, to the, this middle 40. So this means that when Europe goes from 90% of wealth for the top 10 prior to World War I to about 60% today, in between you have 30% of national wealth which used to belong to the top 10, which now belongs to the middle 40. And this is this rise of a patrimonial middle class which I describe in my book as probably the most important transformation in the long run, uh, because even though the middle class still has less wealth than the rich, in spite of the fact that they are four times more numerous, uh, it's still significant you know, to own 30% of total wealth rather than 5 or 10%. You know, this makes a, a big difference. Now, the, in recent decades, the share going to the top has started to increase again which means that the share going to the middle class has, has started to decline. And one issue is to understand why. First, we are going to try to understand how the total value of wealth has changed. Now, what is striking, so this is a different evolution, this is the wealth income ratio. And what's striking is that for wealth income ratio, 
Europe is actually above the US. So in, the U in Europe, there is less inequality of wealth than the US, but the, the total value of wealth relative to national income is higher. So that's why it's important to distinguish these two dimensions, because they, can, they don't need to move together. And so if you want to understand this big evolution of the wealth to income ratio, you can uh, also decompose between different countries. So these are three European countries, Germany, France, UK. You can see that everywhere you have a very high ratio of wealth to income um, uh, prior to World War I. So of course you have a lot of destruction and also a lack of investment between 1910 and 1950. Also a lot of private wealth uh, was either nationalized after World War II or its private value was reduced by uh, new sets of institutions and policies including rent control for housing values. So that the private value of wealth in 1950 is extremely small by historical standards. And then it has started to increase again uh, in, the, in the past half century and is now not quite as large as what it used to be in the 19th century, but it's getting, it's getting uh, closer. Now, how can we understand this big evolution? So first point is that you know, there's nothing bad with high wealth to income ratio, and to a large extent, it comes from a natural evolution with post-war reconstruction and the slowdown of growth. As I mentioned before, when you have a slowdown of growth in recent decades, you tend to accumulate more wealth relative to income. That's partly due to aging. And this is not necessarily bad in itself. Now, the problem is that this creates new policy challenges in terms of financial regulation, real estate bubbles, uh, return of inheritance, uh, which is now for the new generation uh, uh, very important uh, in, in Europe and also in, in Japan. And in order to analyze these issues, what, what I really probably the, the most important message of this presentation is that I really try in my book to, to develop a multi-dimensional approach to the history of capital and property relations. Uh, you know, when you do this big addition and compute the total value of all assets, you know, you are really doing something very abstract. And, and the reason why my book is relatively long is because I actually try to analyze in a separate way each separate assets, you know, from land to business assets to foreign assets, real estate, public debt, immaterial capital, and all these different kinds of property give rise to different institutional challenges, uh, to different negotiation between owners of capital and, and those who mostly own their labor. And, and they really need to be, to be analyzed separately if we want to, to understand them properly. And, and it's more than just making the big addition. So let me take a couple of examples to illustrate this point. First, if you look in the very long run, so this is the decomposition of the structure of property in, in the United Kingdom. So uh, you don't see the color very well, but let me just say that the bottom part in the 18th century is agricultural land. So you can see that at the beginning of the period, agricultural land is a very big part of, of wealth. The middle part is housing, which was less important in the 18th century, but is now very important, partly due to a very high price for housing maybe reflecting partly a bubble, but also the fact that you know, many people want to live in the same place and, and the, there could be something structural in these very high housing prices. The third part is other domestic capital, which is basically business assets, which becomes very important with the Industrial Revolution. And you have a little white part, which is very important on the eve, at the eve of World War I, which is net foreign capital. So this is what Britain owns in the rest of the world. And you can see that this is very significant. You have almost two years of national income, uh, almost one third of everything the Brits own in 1910 is as they own part of the rest of the world. And of course, that's related to their colonial empire. Uh, you have in France, you know, there's a smaller colonial empire, but still it's quite significant. It's more than one year of national income in foreign assets. Uh, and now this disappears entirely in France and Britain uh, during the 20th century. Partly is decolonization, but most of it is really World War I and World War II, where to finance the war, to pay for the war, uh, many of the rich French and Brits have to sell their foreign assets, buy some public 
bonds to their government and then their public uh, bonds will be inflated away after 1945 so that in the end they, they, don't, they don't own much uh, after that. Okay, so that's a big part of the process and if you just look at the big addition and you don't look separately at these different assets, you cannot really understand uh, the whole thing. So what's striking in the long run is that you have metamorphosis of capital in the sense that agricultural land is not really playing a big role today. But the total value of assets uh, is, is, is getting similar, like in Britain in 2010 than, than uh, uh, in the 19th or 18th century, but with very different form of assets. Let me uh, mention also that if you look at annual series for more countries, so here you have the same private wealth to national income ratio in more countries, you can see the Japanese bubble in 1990 and generally speaking, what you can see is that bubbles in, on price of real estate and, and very sharp movement uh, on price of, of ca other capital assets play a big role. So the, you know, the, the, the history of capital is never quiet. You know, it is full of crises, it is full of uh, volatility because it's difficult to put a price of assets also. You know, it, putting a price on real estate or putting a price on, on, a, on, a, on the stock market, you know, some people do this for a business and that's, uh, that's complicated. And so you have all these big variations. Uh, if you look at the, so this is the Spanish bubble over there, which is even bigger than the, uh, than the, than the Japanese bubble. You can see that in Spain, in 2007, the total market value of private wealth relative to national income was eight years of national income. Uh, even more than in Japan, where it was seven years of national income in 1990. Okay, so this creates new challenge you know, in terms of financial regulation. You know, in 1970, the ratio of private wealth to national income was only two to three years between. So these are the top eight or top nine developed economies in the world. So everywhere it was between two and three and a half years. Uh, so uh, whereas today it's between four and seven or eight years. Okay? So of course, if you make a 10% mistake on the price of your real estate in Spain, or in Japan, when you have a ratio of six or seven years of GDP in private wealth, you know, this is a mistake that can have very big consequences, much bigger than when, when it's a ratio of two or three. So this creates new policy uh, challenges. Uh, let me also mention that a significant part of the increase in private wealth to GDP ratio is also a transfer from public to private capital. So you have privatization of public assets and you have an increase in public debt. So public capital, so you can see, well, again, you don't see the color very well, but I just want to mention one example. Look at Italy. Italy is the bottom point for public capital and actually the top point for private capital. So bottom point for public capital, look, Italy is negative for public capital. What does this mean? This means that even if the Italian government were selling all the public assets, all the public buildings, schools, hospitals, financial assets, they don't have much, but assume they sell everything, that will not be enough to repay the public debt. They will still have about minus 60, 70% of national income in public debt. So, this is, so I'm not saying they should do this, but you know, it's important to realize that in a way, you know, many people would be shocked if we had to pay uh, rent to the private owners of the schools to which we send our children. So I'm, you know, I'm not saying they should do this, but it's important to realize that in a way this is already what they are doing because when you have a public debt that's bigger than the value of your public assets, in effect what you have to pay in interest payment for your public debt can be higher than what would be the rental value of your, of your public assets. So it's a bit more abstract because it goes through the financial intermediation system, but in the end it's very concrete. Right now in Italy they are paying 5-6% of GDP each year in interest payment. Uh, whereas the total budget of their entire public university system is about 1% of GDP. And so is this the right way to prepare the future for the new generation? You know, it's not entirely clear. Uh, so I try to put these issues into historical uh, perspective. Britain in the 19th century is a country where the holders of public debt, the rentiers of public debt, you know, are very powerful not only in the novels of Jane Austen but also in the real politics of the time and, and, uh, and they managed to get the country to repay during an entire century 2-3% of GDP in interest payment in budget surplus each year which is more than the total education budget of Britain at, the, at that time and during an entire century the country reduces the vast public debt of 200% of GDP 
that came from the Napoleonic War to 20, 30 percent of GDP at the eve of World War I. So it worked, but it took an entire century of repaying interest payment. And, and you know, I wouldn't like Europe to make the same mistake uh, today. But uh, anyway, that's what one of the things for which history can be can be uh, useful. Uh, so let me also mention uh, uh, very quickly some of the particular features of capital and inequality in, in the United States of America. And le let me say, you know, inequality in America has a different structure as in Europe. Uh, and this was already like this in the 19th century, where you have, as, as, as we like to say, the land of opportunity. Capital accumulated in the past matters less than Europe partly because of perpetual population growth, which is in a way a way to reduce the level of inherited wealth. And at the same time, this is the land of slavery, which is in a way the most extreme form of property uh, uh, relation. And you know, I, I just finished yesterday reading uh, Sven's book, and uh, you know, I regret that I couldn't read it uh, before when I, when I wrote my book. But certainly, you know, the importance of slavery, uh, you know, we, we all know after uh, Sven's book, you know, the importance it had in the uh, development of capitalism in this country and in, in global history as well. I try also in my book to illustrate this in the following manner. You know, if you look at the total value of, of wealth, uh, say in Britain in the 18th century, you have very high ratio of wealth to income. If you look in the US, so this is with the same scale, you can see that the ratio is much lower in particular because the value of agricultural land is much lower. Okay, so land prices are very low in the US in the 19th century. We all know this, you know, Tocqueville wrote about this, and Tocqueville thought this was, you know, one of the origin of the democratic spirit of America was that everybody could own land and everybody can access land. So if you just own land, you cannot be very rich because there is so much land that the price of land is very small. And generally speaking, the total value of everything there is to own in the country is not very high. So you cannot be very rich just by owning land, or you need to own a lot of land. But of course, if you have the clever idea to own not only the land, but also the people who work on the land, then you can manage to be a lot richer. So here, this is the value of slaves, the market value of slaves at that time. And then you get to wealth to income ratios that are much closer to the European level in the 19th century with, of course, big variation between the south of the US and the north of the US. So that's why you know, the US is, a, at the same time in the north, the place where wealth accumulated in the past is not very important, in particular because the value of agricultural land is very cheap. Whereas in the south, the slaves basically more than compensate for the lower value of the land, and this corresponds to an inequality structure and a, and a, a structure of domination based on property, which in many ways is, is, is much more violent than what you have in, uh, in, uh, in old Europe. Okay, so you have this contrast uh, between, uh, between different parts of the US and the particular relationship of the US with, uh, with capital and with inequality, which, uh, which I try to emphasize in my book. And you know, again, this is a uh, you know, very extreme case where property rights you know, are, are socially, historically determined, and uh, you, know, you cannot just take them as given uh, forever. So they vary over time. They are social construction. Uh, to give just another example of this, taking uh, an example that is much, much closer to us today uh, from Germany, uh, it's interesting, you know, if you remember when I show you the graph with uh, uh, Britain, France, and Germany, that the, you have lower market values of capital assets in Germany as compared to France and, and Britain. And one interesting question is why? So very often people talk about lower real estate prices in Germany, which could be related also to different housing market regulation in Germany. But in fact, the biggest part comes from lower stock market capitalization of corporations in Germany. And one interpretation you know, is what we sometimes call stakeholder capitalism, which is that shareholders uh, in Germany have to share power a little more than in other countries with worker representatives, sometimes regional government, so that at the end of the day, the market value is less than the book value of corporation. Now, apparently, this does not prevent German companies from producing good cars. So you know, the fact that you have a lower market value of companies is not bad in itself. And this example clearly illustrates that market and social values of capital can be very different, and that more generally property relations are socially, legally, historically determined. There are different ways to distribute power 
So capital ownership is about power, and there are different ways to regulate and to organize uh, power. Uh, I guess, uh, I, so this is a graph illustrating the ratio of market value and book value of corporations. That's again taken from my book. You can find it online, but you can see that for Germany, so according to the textbook model of perfect capital market, the ratio should always be equal to 100%. You know, if you have the market value, the book value should be the same. Now in practice, in Germany, it's always much less than 100%, like 60%. So the market value is 60%. Uh, whereas in US and the UK, it's more than, than 100%, at least in certain periods, or much closer to 100%. So you have a, you know, the market and book values of companies differ systematically across countries, and this can be interpreted as evidence for different uh, regulation of, of uh, ownership and, and, uh, and, and, and corporate uh, uh, power in different uh, countries. Uh, I'm going to move very, very fast to the third point about the future of wealth inequality. This is where the gap between R and G is playing a role. So you can see that in everything I have said so far, uh, R minus G doesn't play any role. You know, it's, uh, uh, you know I, I have to confess you today that you know, this whole thing about R and G was sort of a marketing trick, which apparently worked very well, because many, many people thought uh, you know, they could summarize a book with one equation, which, of course, I, I, you know, I don't believe that you can summarize uh, 300 years of historical evolution about income and wealth with one equation. There are many different institutions, policy, historical forces that play role. There is one area with R minus G might be important, which is if you want to understand the long run evolution of the concentration of property. And here the gap between R and G might be important. During most of human history, the gap was large for a simple reason, which is that the growth rate in pre-industrial society was close to zero. And so the rate of return to land was typically 4 or 5%. It could vary with legal arrangements under feudalism, but it was certainly never 0%. Um, uh, now, one of the findings of my book is that the modern industrial revolution did not change this basic relationship between R and G as much as one might have expected. And it's only really the big shocks of the 20th century that have completely turned upside down this relation between uh, at least net of tax, net of destruction, rate of return, and growth rate uh, because of the shocks due to the war, because of the very fast growth of the post-growth period, of the post-war period. Now, in the future, you know, it looks as if growth rates, in particular for population, will be less than what they were in the, in the past. And uh, competition between countries to attract uh, capital, uh, maybe also financial deregulation, can contribute to high rate of return, in particular for high uh, wealth portfolio. Uh, one of the problems is that there's probably too little transparency about global wealth dynamics, and particularly cross-border financial assets. And I think this is a problem in rich countries, but this is even more a problem in emerging countries, in particular China, Latin America, Africa, where a very big part of the capital stock is owned either by, by, by local or foreign elites through uh, 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 offshore uh, assets and, and, and uh, um, uh, tax havens, which makes it very difficult for a democratic regulation of inequality, uh, and that's a big, a big challenge for the, for the future. So I'm, I'm not going to present this in a detailed manner, just to mention that you know, if you look at data coming from wealth rankings, so this is a table coming from the Forbes billionaires wealth rankings, it looks as if the very top wealth groups uh, at the world level are rising a lot faster than average wealth. Uh, le let me make clear that this is not particularly reliable data. You know, it's hard sometimes to know what the, what the, you know, how the, the Forbes people uh, compute their ranking, but you know, we live at a time, you know, it's a bit sad. You know, I would prefer to read uh, IMF publication or Eurostat publication or you know, US government publication to know about wealth dynamics, but you wouldn't find the, the uh, data, partly because for lack of transparency and automatic transmission of information about cross-border financial assets. So we have to do with what we have. And so in, in my book, I am very pragmatic with data sources. You know, there's no perfect data sources. And, and so I use a little bit this Forbes magazine uh, at some point. Uh, and what you can see is that here you have a major divergence between the average income uh, 
at the, the average wealth at the top and the average wealth in the world, which is not so easy to explain because, you know, sometimes people say, well, okay, but this is because you have a lot of new billionaires who, who uh, make wealth. And, and indeed, the people at the top are not the same, you know, in 2013 and 1987. You know, according to Forbes, the people at the top in 1987 are uh, Japanese billionaires, which everybody has forgotten their name now. Uh, whereas in 2013, you have Carlos Slim, you have Bill Gates, etc. Uh, but the fact that you have some mobility, the fact that you have all of these new people at the top, uh, this in itself does not explain why the average wealth in this top group should rise three or four times faster than average wealth in the world. Because the fact that you have mobility, you know, in principle, you have some people who go down, you have some people who go up, if you were in an equilibrium of the world distribution of wealth, you know, these two effects should more or less compensate each other. And, and the average wealth in this top group should rise more or less at the same speed as average wealth in the world. You know, it's, it's okay to have very rich people, very poor people, very middle people, as long as the different groups in the long run sort of rise at the same speed. Well, maybe not exactly at the same speed, but at speeds that are roughly comparable. But you cannot have forever, you know, average wealth at the top rising three, four times faster than average wealth for the entire world economy. Because you know, if this was to continue, the share of global wealth going to the top will rise to 100%, which everybody would argue is probably too much. And you know, I'm not saying it's going to go. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not saying it will go to 100%. I'm sure it will stop before that. But where exactly will it stop? You know, nobody really knows. And this is an issue. Uh, uh, so why, why, why is this happening? You know, I think there's been a lot of uh, uh, privatization in recent decades that have produced, you know, uh, uh, in certainly, uh, you know, Russian oligarchs who did not become rich uh, through uh, uh, saving. You know, they became rich by becoming the, uh, the owner of, uh, of uh, a large chunk of public assets at very low prices. This also happened, you know, if you take, uh, uh, you know, Carlos Slim uh, did not invent uh, the, the, the cell phone. Uh, you, know, it's also, you know, innovation is important, but in many cases, you can see that at the origins of some of these large fortunes, you also have a privatization, you have inheritance, uh, you know, you don't have the same level of violence which uh, Sven uh, talks to us about in his book on the history of capitalism, but you, you know, it's far from being steady, you know, it's a process where, uh, you know, being at the right time, at the right place in order to acquire a big part of public property at a very low price played a big role in this time period. Now, in the future, well, you know, there's not much left to privatize in many of these countries, so this is not going to last forever, so that's one possible regulation. Um, although, by increasing the public debt, you know, you can have a, a large negative public wealth, and this can, uh, this can allow you to go further even when there's not much less to privatize. I think, uh, you know, part of the reason for this is also that financial deregulation has probably increased the inequality in access to high financial returns. So that's good for, for places like Harvard. Let me conclude this with this. So you saw this is the return to uh, Harvard endowment. So uh, you know the reason I'm showing you university endowment is not to conclude with Harvard, but rather because at least these people publish data. You know, that's the good thing about US universities is that at least we know what they do with their portfolio. We know why they get the returns they get, which we don't know for the Forbes people. So that's why I use this data. So you can see that you have about 850 US universities with capital on demand. They have done very well. 8.2% you know, net of inflation, net of administrative cost between 1918 and 2010. And the higher the initial on demand, the, the higher the return. So for Harvard, you have 10.2%. Uh, which, is, which is quite good. So I'm not saying it will be as high in the next three decades. You know, there were particular circumstances, but still this illustrates a mechanism through which, uh, you know, inequality can, can feed itself if you, you know, according to the textbook economic model, what a perfect capital market should do is that everybody should get the highest return on the planet. So, you know, you go to your bank with $100,000 and your money gets invested in China the next morning and you get the highest yield on the planet. But, you know, real world capital market don't seem to work exactly this way. And, you know, sometimes, uh, the, you know, if you have 
uh, if you are able to access very sophisticated uh, financial products, uh, so the, the portfolio of Harvard is, is made of uh, 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 private equity, uh, commodity derivatives, and, and you know complex financial products which are very difficult to access to if you just go to your bank with one hundred thousand uh, dollars. The the fee. The management fees paid by Harvard right now are of the order of 0.5 percent per year, which is very small. But if you have 40 billion on demand and you spend 0.5 percent, you know you, you can still uh, uh, spend more than 100 million each year in uh, to pay a group of financial advisors. And so if this allows you to get 10 percent rather than six, then that's that's worth it. Uh, uh, this is uh, you know that's interesting. Just to conclude. Uh, to compare this with the amount of giving uh, that was made to, uh, to the Harvard endowment over the same time period. And over the same time period, you know, you have of the order, it's a little bit like the, the management fees now, it's of the order of 0 0.5, 0 0.5 to 1% of the endowment each year in giving. So as compared by former students. Okay, so as compared to the financial return, this is really negligible. Well, sometimes that's, that's useful if you want to get your children admitted to Harvard, but in terms of, uh, you know, if you want to explain the rise of the, of the endowment, you know, the R is very important, okay? So R versus G, you know, is an issue that can be, you know, quite significant uh, when you look at large university endowments, which can also be important maybe for the world distribution of wealth to try to explain why top wealth groups are doing structurally better than the middle class. Let me stop there. Sorry for being a bit uh, a bit too long, and, and thanks again for welcoming me uh, in your uh, in your program. Okay. Great, thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you. Thank you. thank you very much. It's wonderful to be here, and I and I appreciate the opportunity. I'm honored by the opportunity to comment a bit on the talk. It's terrific to welcome you here to the Harvard Law School, in part because your book and also your talk invites a kind of dialogue with policy and legal people. So how did this come about, and what could be done about it? Are there kinds of mechanical questions you invite us uh, to consider? And there's kind of a puzzle about the book. It's an incredibly institutionalist book wrapped up in a formula. Um, and the marketing trick that you mentioned at the end may be somehow uh, an explanation there. But th this is a, is a book that identifies an enduring link between capitalism and inequality in the form of a historic normal in which returns to capital outpace economic growth. So this is the formula with which you ended. Um, and There'd be a fascinating conversation to have, I think, about how um, differently in legal and economic specialties a word like capitalism or even capital comes to suggest a system within which you can speak about historical regularities that function as, in one way or another, uh, logic or laws, um, and the way in which big stories get constructed out of data and then need to be broken down in these institutionalist ways. But rather than, than that, I think what I would do is speak just very briefly about uh, the legal and uh, international dimensions of the story. To pick up the invitation that we engage with the question, what does law have to do with it? Uh, uh, and so. How do legal people think about inequality? Well, it's very common, I think, for legal people um, to accept a story about society that comes from economics. And here, Professor Piketty's is a perfectly useful one. And then try to construct a response out of the available policy tools. And to a certain extent, the kinds of tools one thinks of are tax and transfer tools. So we can. The transfer could happen through schooling. The transfer could happen even through a minimum wage. But the basic idea is capitalism is what it is. Um, and then if the state can't respond in this way, we have to live with it in some sense. But I, I want to propose a second kind of legal frame that's opened up by many of the examples in Professor Piketty's book in which we would get more down in the weeds where the actors and the structures that Professor Piketty interprets as part of the story of capitalism, get put together and where they might seem to be, in one or another way, more plastic. Uh, 
I mean, it's obvious but easy to forget, and he stresses this repeatedly, that the foundations of economic life are legal. Capital, labor, money. Law doesn't just regulate these things. It doesn't just tax them. Uh, it also creates them, and it could create them in different ways with different distributional outcomes and potentially different trajectories for society over time. So just as there are alternatives to capitalism, there are also alternatives within it, and a legal question would be, how do we figure that out? What are the alternatives, and how does law set us on one path rather than another? So on the micro side, you could imagine drilling down beneath aggregate institutional identities like labor and capital and state and so forth to think about people facing each other in some kind of struggle over gains in which their relative uh, power vis-a-vis -vis one another is a function of their entitlements and their uh, vulnerabilities. So in this sense, Ricardo was right, rent is everything. Economic gain arises from a legal entitlement, whether to land or anything else, to exclude somebody else from an element of value. And a map of entitlements at the micro level would be a map of coercive powers. Uh, and the distribution of bargaining power, but also the dis that makes it sound like we're going to have a discussion. The, this, the, the distribution of the coercive ability to force someone to forego gain that they might otherwise have hoped to enjoy. There are lots of obvious examples, um, intellectual property, inheritance law, and so forth. Um, and you bring up a number of them also in your talk. On the macro side, there'd be uh, the process by which legal powers and vulnerabilities bunch. And here I think you were just getting to that at the end with your story about the Harvard um, endowment and the, the, how is it that to those who have more and more comes, what is the process by which the status of forces between groups, not between individuals, is settled in society? Between creditors and debtors, local workers and foreign investors and so on. And how is it that the outcomes of past struggles bear down on current deals? So seeing it as a past settlement that arose through a bargain and a competition is a different, gives a different flavor to the idea of the weight of history uh, than imagining it simply as an accumulation of money. And then there'd be a dynamic element. Virtuous and vicious cycles would get going as legal arrangements made it easier or more difficult for differences to compound. So if we went at inequality with these legal ideas in mind, I think we might come up with a wider range of responses than transnational taxes or stronger federal regional authority and so forth. A long march through the institutions could rejiggle things in ways that would strengthen the relative coercive powers of people that we wanted to favor and promote more virtuous cycles between the haves and the have-nots. Without a large theory, about how much inequality was good or bad for capitalism or the development of the society as a whole, simply as an effort to strengthen the hands of those uh, whose coercive powers are now too few. And it's not that difficult to figure out how, because people have been struggling intensely over legal regimes in these terms for a long time. You mentioned rent control as a very important uh, struggle over the um, value and use potential of some forms of real estate. Um, but you could also alter contract and employer, employer law to empower unions. You could change housing and local government law to link housing for the rich to public services for the poor. You could change the rules of finance and consumer protection to shift power from creditors to debtors and penalize exploitative financialization and so on. Indeed. You can shift the power uh, between identity groups, men and women, blacks and whites, old and young, future generations and current generations in similar uh, ways. So that's the legal background. There are lots of ways to address the dynamics of inequality beyond transfer payments from wealthier to poorer. It's possible somehow to link leading and lagging sectors or regions either within a country or between countries to one another productively. So a few words about the international dimensions of the story. The data that Professor Piketty brings together is comparative national data on inequality within one country, which he's extended to quite a number of countries and is now extending, as we heard, to even more. But these comparisons, as he acknowledges, are extremely difficult. Um, and it's hard to say what this means about inequality at the global level. 
So does data, tax data, for example, exaggerate the inequality between countries where countries have really different ways of understanding income reporting and different cultural practices with regard to taxation? Uh, but, but whatever the story is about national inequality, it seems to me global inequality is harder to assess or understand what we think about it. So within a country, the um, existence of the 1% rankles when other people's incomes are stagnant uh, at some point. But imagine the following. Imagine it turned out that global poverty and inequality could be reduced if we empowered a super rich class of financiers, the 0.01 percenters, and we allowed wages to fall in the richest quarter of countries through a combination of sort of financialization on the one hand and factor price equalization for labor on the other hand. If we knew that that was true, Professor Piketty's findings about in-country inequality might look very different. You could still jiggle things to improve equality, but financialization might not require so much supercharging of the rich, but if you thought that it did and that overall global inequality uh, might thereby be reduced, you might have a different attitude towards it. Moreover, the international situation is also a legal situation. The global economic and political space is intensely legalized, and you can map legal arrangements globally that enable the capture of rent and contribute to center periphery dynamics just as you can at the domestic level. So there's a global rent story. Who may coerce a greater share of the gains from, let's say, natural gas exploitation, Qatar or Chevron? The answer will lie in uh, legal arrangements, sovereign powers, control over technology, know-how, monopoly power, the law regulating finance and corporate law, all those will affect who gets the gain from the natural gas that's being pumped out in the Gulf. What powers permit upgrading or force downgrading in a global value chain? The law governing the ability to garner innovation rents, antitrust law, and so forth. And there's a global story about center periphery relations. What legal arrangements speed the compounding of gains? The mobility of capital, the fragmentation of jurisdictions, the fact that private rights travel more easily than public powers, all these things change the speed with which some wealth aggregates and others do not. Just as the terms of trade between Detroit and its suburbs, that's where I'm from, uh, is a function of everything from jurisdictional boundaries to rules about school finance, so the transnational dualisms that we see between regions and countries are a function of international economic law and international private law. So it's a complicated story, and in short, geography matters, and geography is a legal construct. Who can do what in re relationship to whom with what force? So to sum up, I think Professor Piketty has identified a tendency. And to explore how the tendency arises, how it's sustained and might be changed, requires that we somehow open up the hood and look inside market capitalism to see how it's put together. And it turns out the glue that distributes is law. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. Uh, I'm, uh, like the other speakers here, honored to be part of this program. This is a magnificent book. <laughs> we, all, we all knew that inequality was rising. Uh, what we lacked um, was any kind of historical and international perspective to put this in. And this uh, his book has done this in spades. It's really uh, opened up a whole uh, new field of uh, research. And the economics profession uh, should be uh, in Professor Piketty's debt for uh, some time to come. Uh, This book is a classic. <laughs> it's right up there with the uh, other books that uh, economists often talk about, 
but rarely have read. I could tell you a story about that too, but I'm only allowed 10 minutes. Yeah, five. Uh, five, you said, but he really, he really meant 10. You know, there's been inflation, a lot of inflation. Right, since yesterday. Yeah. Um, this fellow, Jordan Ellenberg, did a um, uh, sci scientific research on uh, Professor Piketty's book. Uh, and um, he discovered that uh, few people had got beyond page 26, uh, which made it the new record. The record up to that time, as he said, was held by Stephen Hawking uh, for a book most owned and least read. And now that record is passed to uh, Professor Piketty. What's that? Um, <coughs> I have to say, and I, I hope you'll uh, forgive me for this too, um, I and the other speakers didn't know, this is a 500 plus page book, uh, we didn't know what part of it Professor Piketty was going to emphasize, so we had to uh, prepare our remarks on the basis of the book and not on the talk. Um, uh, I did not know that R greater than G was a marketing ploy. Uh, I, like many others, thought that that really was uh, a theoretical uh, argument, or, sorry, a theoretical come empirical argument uh, that structured the book. Um, so I'm actually going to spend a lot of time, I, I can't spend a lot of time, I'm going to spend a large fraction of time on uh, that particular point. But I should say before that, that much of what's of value in this book uh, is quite independent of that inequality, and a good thing, too, uh, because I will suggest that that inequality uh, should not surprise anybody. It is not a contradiction of capitalism. Uh, it's exactly what you would expect. It's the norm. Um, moreover, it is not in itself destabilizing. Uh, I'm writing it here with a subscript, which you don't usually see. Uh, the subscript Y to emphasize that is, this is about the growth of income and output, uh, not the growth of the capital stock, though those two are obviously uh, related. Here are three excerpts, brief exper excerpts from the book about the importance of this inequality. Uh, the first one, I think really is very important, and I think it's absolutely correct. If you think about it, it's not a contradiction of capitalism. It's a contradiction of capitalism with democracy. We had a chat at lunch about how these two are related, inconclusive as you might expect such a chat conversation to be. Uh, but this really is, uh, I believe, a contradiction, but not a contradiction of capital, not a contradiction of capitalism, not a contradiction of growth. The last statement is just flat out wrong. Just flat out wrong. <laughs> Piketty's laws are correct. He has three of them. We only uh, will emphasize one, but there are three laws. And they're absolutely and invariably correct because they are laws of arithmetic. They're not laws of economics. They're not laws, certainly, of uh, capital. Here they are displayed. We don't have any time to go through them in detail. <laughs> uh, but the notation, I'm sorry, I, I, I uh, realize that this is inside baseball. Because if you didn't get beyond page 26, then uh, this is not going to be um, uh, crystal clear. Uh, but if, you're, if you did get beyond p page 26, it, will, it should be uh, familiar. But I'm going to pick them up. So the first one of his laws is that the capital share is equal to the rate of return on capital times the capital output ratio. Well, that's true because they're both the same thing. Uh, so that's, that's fine. The second law, and there's two versions of it. One is uh, in terms of the rate of growth of the capital stock, which is why I made the dis distinction in the first place. The other is in the rate of growth of income. Uh, but they both, whichever way you put it, they are both uh, arithmetic laws. 
from those, uh, you can deduce uh, a third law, which is not exactly uh, Piketty's law, but it says, it gives the condition under which, how much time do I have? Five, oh, that's okay, we'll get there. Uh, it gives the condition under which uh, R will exceed uh, the rate of growth of output, and that condition is subject to a difference between the incremental capital output ratio and the average capital output ratio, a relationship between the rate of saving in the economy and the capital share. So basically, as long as the capital share exceeds the rate of savings, then R will be greater than G. Okay. It's as simple as that. Uh, normally, that's the case under capitalism. It's not logically necessary, but it is normally the case. Nor is it, nor is it a reason why uh, the uh, uh, capital concentration uh, must grow. Because Piketty's argument is that as in the 19th century, the likely course, the course for the last 30, 40 years and the likely course in the future is that the share of profits, the share of capital will grow and it will grow uh, as against a uh, constant rate of saving and therefore as that ratio uh, grows, uh, as alpha becomes larger and larger than the savings rate, R will grow relative to G. As alpha grows, as the capital share grows, inequality will grow because capital income is, <laughs> capital income is uh, more concentrated than labor income. That's the story. Uh, I uh, have to say that uh, the theory that this this is a uh, not an empirical argument; it's a uh, theoretical argument. Uh, and the theory um, I, I have to say in this book does not match the empirical uh, originality, perseverance, uh, intelligence that um, uh, the book uh, shows. Uh, the theory is at best uh, uh, elementary and um, it, just doesn't, it just doesn't come to the level that the empirical arguments come to. Um, first question, why does uh, beta rise over time? Why does the capital output ratio, I'm sorry, rise or fall over time? Well, this is what uh, Piketty and his colleagues said uh, in a companion paper to this volume, uh, they say it's, um, uh, in short, capital is back, capital output ratio is growing because low growth is back. Well, that's true as an, as an uh, accounting identity. The two have to move together. We see that from the fact that those equations uh, are necessarily logically true. But it doesn't say anything about what's causing what. It doesn't say anything about what's causing what. Two more minutes. So here is the, uh, here is this, the same thing, that if you look at the rate of growth of the capital stock, uh, that uh, as I said, the, uh, the rate of return on capital will exceed the rate of growth provided the uh, share of capital exceeds the in income exceeds the savings rate. Uh, here is a diagram that uh, indicates a relationship between rate of return on capital rate of growth of the capital stock, uh, and a very simple uh, assumption about the economy, that there are two classes of people, there are rentiers, 
pat patrimonial uh, uh, capital which is passed down from generation to generation. And then there's a middle class of wage earners and savers. Leave the, the poor out of this. They don't save, they don't enter into accumulation. Uh, and the solid line gives the relationship between I'm almost done. Between uh, the growth of the capital stock and the uh, rate of return on capital. So, yeah, in most of this, you're in a region where R exceeds the uh, uh, rate of growth. Um, but there's, uh, and to each of, each of the, you're not necessarily there. Here's a region where at low rates of uh, uh, return, the rate of growth will exceed uh, the rate of return. So it's not logically necessary, uh, but the uh, main point is that each of these is, uh, corresponds to a stable division of capital. It does not necessarily imply any kind of increasing concentration. So look at these purple colored uh, part. This is all a situation in which uh, Piketty's inequality holds, uh, but wealth accumulated in the past is not growing more rapidly uh, than output and wages, they're growing at exactly the same rate. Uh, so there's no necessary tendency uh, for the, uh, uh, for in income inequality to worsen. Is this, a, is this a theory? No, it's not a theory. It's a, uh, an argument that says that a theory is missing from uh, Piketty's capital in the 21st century. Uh, does that make the book any less magnificent? No, not in the slightest, because what Piketty has done is give us the basis for thinking about, theorizing about uh, how uh, the situation of the present is similar to the situation of the past, how the situation of the present is likely uh, to evolve in the future. And for this, we are all in your debt. Thank you so much, Steve. And uh, Chris. So I've been asked, can you hear me? Yes. I've been asked to stay here to be quicker. And that's OK, because I feel like a justice is the only time in my life I'll ever feel like I'm on the, on the court's podium. Uh, Thomas Piketty has changed the debate over inequality. His arguments are arresting. They transform impressions into trends, and then they confront us with the trends. They're, his data is compelling. Even those who qualify one aspect or another accept the larger picture as persuasive. His work is transparent. He makes his data and his arguments very clear and available to, audience, to all of us. And we are a large audience, so there are overflow rooms in this case. I could continue with the praise, but I'm supposed to be quick. So I'm going to get to one theme, and I have a few questions wrapped into this discussion of one of Professor Piketty's themes. So he concludes, his last chapter concludes this way. If democracy is someday to regain control of capitalism, it must start by recognizing that the concrete institutions in which democracy and capitalism are embodied need to be reinvented again and again. So his focus is the concrete institutions that embody democracy and capitalism. That's an invitation to the many of us whose lives and work revolve around institutions. And that's political scientists, it's sociologists, it's historians, but it's also members of the public. And it's also law students and lawyers. I'm going to talk very particularly to the latter, law students, legal historians, lawyers, because our work is in institutional design. Law puts political determinations into effect by institutionalizing them through legislation, through regulations, through court decisions, through norms, through the creation of categories. Uh, law implements political conclusions. It builds the institutions we inhabit. So I want to be concrete about that. I'll just give two examples, one very stark, 
and one uh, more sweeping as, as an institutional matter. The stark one uh, picks up very much on what David Kennedy said. So Professor Piketty gives us many aggregates, capital stock, economic growth. These things only have meaning because of their legal components, components like wages and assets. Uh, so David's uh, beautiful description of legal assets as, um, as depending on the, pre the settlement of previous bargaining processes. I was going to come up with an, I have an, an example of an asset, but in fact, Professor Piketty's presentation made me cross that out, slavery. Slaves are the most obvious example of an asset, the value of which, insofar as people had a market value, it was because they were, it, because slavery was legal, right? So an asset depends on its legal definition. So that's the stark example. I want to move to the more sleep, sweeping institutional um, uh, example, and this is to show the impact of legal design on capitalism, or to look at capitalism as an institutional form. So I'm going to preface it with a question to Professor Piketty. What do you mean by capitalism? Does the, do the concrete institutions that make up capitalism hang together somehow? Can we understand capitalism as something? Why does capitalism matter if returns to capital are higher than economic growth in earlier ages as well as our own? I think there are answers to this question. I think they matter. Uh, I think we need to have a coherent definition of capitalism if we're going to take it on, if we're going to rethink it. So here's an answer. I'm going to give a very specific answer about legal architecture or institutional architecture of capitalism. In 1700, capitalism was redesigned. We get a whole series of new institutions. We get new forms of money and finance. They depend on each other. They re-engineer wealth and production. They create a new architecture for the market, and that architecture, that infrastructure, is what we call capitalism. So I'm going to identify just four elements to the new architecture. First, we get the invention of circulating credible public debt, which, as Professor Piketty points out, is extremely important. Public bonds look boring, but they are the first financial instrument pitched to the general public. A public bond is an instrument that asks people, regular individuals, to lend to the public, lend to the government, and it gives them a reward for doing so. That's an innovation, one that has legal import. So it changes the way people think about material interest. It changes the way they think about self-interest. It makes it acceptable, even patriotic, to follow one's self-interest. And governments soon grant public creditors a right to repayment. This is the financial instrument that Jane Austen's gentlemen are holding for good reason. Right? This is in Professor Piketty's lovely description. Second, we get the innovation of modern cash. That, the innovation of modern cash follows the innovation of public bonds. Public bonds furnish the collateral, the security, against which public bank, national banknotes are issued. So banknotes are issued against public bonds. Uh, by national banks, and they travel widely against public bonds. Cash backed by public bonds breaks England and later European societies out of the monetary scarcities of the Middle Ages, and those scarcities were scathing. Modern money, modern banknotes, by contrast, issues much more readily than silver coin. It issues when national bank investors take bonds and issue banknotes to the governments that are borrowing from them. And here, just as in the case of public debt, there's a conceptual innovation, a change. The new design puts a premium on profit-oriented calculation. That calculation becomes the pump for money creation, legally, legal change. Third, after public debt and national bank cash come capital mar markets. So public debt and national bank cash together create capital markets and, and provide the money to fuel them. After all, public debt is a legally transferable security. People get together, they start to exchange it. We know the coffee houses in Exchange Alley in London where they start to do this. They, they um, uh, represent a critical mass of traders trading a stable security. And given that, um, that starting point, private securities get, begin to get traded in the same places after public securities. Increasingly, the money used to invest in capital markets will be modern cash, modern bank money. 
the more copious cash of the modern world, not the old awkward commodity money of the, of the Middle Ages. So notice the synergy between public debt, public bonds, national banknotes, and capital markets that we're building. Again, there's a conceptual component. Capital markets direct investment in ways that can be tracked. They transform speculation long despised into something else, or so thought Justice Holmes. So here's Holmes. When he sees the cumulative effect of speculation conducted on an exchange, he calls it a market. So he says, in a landmark case uh, about future trading, that futures trading was not gambling because speculation, as he puts it, by competent men is the self-adjustment of society to the probable. Its value is well known. That speculation via Justice Holmes is ordained beneficial, informative, revelatory in law, which would otherwise terminate it as gambling. A last development. After public debt, national bank money, and capital markets, all new legally engineered institutions, we get commercial banks, a huge expansion of commercial banks. They can lend in a unit everyone recognizes. That's national bank money. They can borrow from each other. They lend into the capital markets. Uh, often holding public bonds as security. They effectively lend more than they hold because they can be rescued by the national banks, now known as central banks, when they fail, which is regularly given their highly leveraged structure. So the asset bubbles that Professor Piketty is talking about come from the structure of commercial banks. As a result, because of the expansion of commercial banks, the money supply expands more than 65-fold in the 19th century. The industry of banking gains the profits on money creation denominated in the national currency in those national banknotes. Taxpayers go into debt to rescue and revive the system when it fails. The cost of rescuing banks, according to Reinhardt and Rogoff, almost doubles public debt on average in the three years following a banking crisis. So here, too, is a conceptual dimension, a shift. Money appears to be something privately created once it comes from these commercial banks. And 97% of the money supply in the modern world comes from commercial banks, not, not the government. My point, this architecture is modern capitalism. These institutions, public debt, modern cash, capital markets, commercial banks, I could add money markets if we had more time, they produce the market. In this market, it is possible to accumulate wealth to a prodigious extent. So uh, the wealth that follows from capital investment and that takes financial form, this is the modern structure of capital that Professor Piketty, Piketty showed. Um, from agricultural, we moved to business capital, to financial capital. This was his slide 4.6, I noticed. Um, this is the new composition of capital. These are the forms of wealth that he flags for us. And those, that wealth is wrapped up in legal forms. It's enabled. It is basically a function of these forms. Ironically, many people miss the public architecture of capitalism altogether. They see powerful markets, they see cash, they see capital, they see securities, they see banks. They fail to see that these are institutions that we have built with a public infrastructure, with public funds, and with law. So why does that oversight matter? That is the failure to see the architecture. If you overlook its public engineering, then the architecture, the engineering, appears to be a natural development. The market appears to be a product of autonomous forces, and the wealth produced on that market appears to be merited, or at least inevitable, given the power of those forces. That impression is reinforced by the conceptual components, the conceptual mo momentum emphasized by the new institutions. So action, one's own self-interest, profit-driven calculation, the tendency to see decentralized market decisions as the revelation of probability as opposed to speculation. These dynamics gain, gain stature as if they were more basic to human activity than, uh, than uh, public coordination and community. By contrast, we can make visible the institutional, the legal components of the architecture we've created. We can revise it. We can find new ways to structure capital. We could impose a more progressive tax. I totally agree with Professor Piketty. There are many other revisions we can make. That's a third, a last question to him. I think he agrees. 
because focusing on a wealth tax alone leaves the rest of the architecture uncontested when it's possible that that architecture, it seems to me that architecture is at the center of the problem. So to return to Professor Pichetti's uh, injunction to us, if democracy is someday to regain control of capitalism, it must start by recognizing that the concrete institutions in which democracy and capitalism are embodied need to be reinvented again and again. I couldn't agree more. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, we now have, uh, we, we will be able to go a little bit over time, so we can probably go until 10 past four, uh, and I hope you're going to be able to stay here. And we want to do so to also give you a chance to participate in this discussion. So I ask Professor Piketty not to respond right away to these comments, but I want you to give, have an opportunity to ask questions or make uh, comments. And there are two microphones at the center of the room, uh, so if you want to ask uh, something, please uh, go there and, and keep your question very short and, uh, and uh, whatever you say, it should have a question mark at, at, at the end, okay? <laughs> so, uh, and we have already two big topics on the table, which we probably cannot resolve here. The one is Sorry. the theory, and the other one is the legal and polit political construction Let's of markets. So, back yeah. Hello, my name is Sabata de Pontes. I'm a college student from Brazil. It's a great honor to be here. And my question is, when you talk about a country like Brazil, who is in the middle income trap, which means that we, can, we don't have very low uh, wages, but we also don't have high technology. Do you still uh, would prescribe the recommendations you have in the book? Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Patrick. Thank you so much for being here, Professor Piketty. So I'm gonna ask a more unconventional question. Um, if you could have dinner with anyone in history, uh, who would it be? <laughs> Anybody who ever was about whom we what? Yeah, one more, my, and then... My name is Julian Duran, I'm a first year student at the college, and my question is, a lot of your critics say that your proposed capital tax would end up taxing innovation, which would, of course, harm economic growth. So I'm just wondering how you would respond to criticisms such as those. Okay, so why don't we take these questions now, and then we'll move on. So please wait for a moment. Come on. Oh, okay. Um, well, let me say a few words also to, to you know to David and Steve and Christine and you know thanks a lot for your for your comments which made me think a lot. Uh, one one or two quick remarks. You know, I, I really like uh, you know uh, David what you what you said about geography as a legal construct and and the, the international dimension of this. Uh, discussion about the, the legal system. This made me think to, I, I wrote recently a paper that's not included in my book about trying to measure inequality at the level of the Middle East as a whole. So, you know, forgetting about the national boundaries and taking together those like 250, 300 million inhabitants from uh, Egypt to Iran and, uh, um, um, and, and so if you do that, uh, you know, basically what you find something which is very obvious but which is important, which that you have a level of inequality of income that is uh, uh, much higher than any other region in the world, and in particular much higher than Latin America or that country like Brazil, which are usually viewed as the most unequal countries. But given the international inequality between, you know, at some point in my book I mentioned Egypt, you know, the total education budget for all schools in Egypt, mm. which is a country with almost 100 million people, is 100 times less than the oil resources going to countries with no population a few hundred kilometers away in the Gulf. So the level of international inequality that you have here is such that if you put all these countries together, even though within country inequality is not necessarily very high, the total inequality uh, is, is much higher. So I think playing around with these boundaries and trying to look at inequality beyond the existing boundaries, which of course are legal constructs, so in the case of the Middle East, uh, you know, some of them are being withdrawn uh, right now. So, so, so these are legal constructs and these are changing legal constructs and also some of them come, uh, uh, you know, have been, have been constructed by the West, of course, and have been supported by, by the West. And, you know, I, I was very influenced as a student uh, by, by two major political events, was when the, was the fall of the Berlin Wall, of course, I was 18 in 1989, but the other one in 1990, 1991 was the first Gulf War, uh, where in effect we were uh, you know, 
protecting a given set of frontiers. And yes, these are legal constructs, and uh, this goes together with the level of inequality that is clearly a part of the story of, wh of what's uh, going on. So probably in the, you know, in, the, in, the, in the book, I don't I take too much the nation state as given, and I don't go enough sort of beyond this. Uh, existing uh, boundaries to, to study inequality, but this is something that I'm, 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 you know, should be done more. Um, let me say, so, uh, let me say a few words to Steve, you know, I, I is, you know, about the marketing trick and R bigger than G, so, you know, it's, uh, what I mean by marketing trick is that there, there is a lot more, uh, mechani many other mechanisms, institutions, policies that play a big role in the book, independently of R bigger than G. Now, let me also mention that in itself, you know, you can have R bigger than G in a world with perfect equality, no inequality at all. You know, all what this means, you know, if, if the growth rate is 1% and the rate of return on average is 5%, all what this means is that, you know, you could be in a society with perfectly equal property uh, of capital, and all what this implies is that the owners, you know, each family needs to uh, reinvest 20% of its capital income and can consume the other 80%, so as to ensure that its wealth rises at the same speed as the size of the economy. And so you could have a perfectly egalitarian model, a, you know, a representative agent model, as economists say, where R is bigger than G, you have perfect equality, and everything is perfectly, is perfectly fine. So, and in a way, yes, this is a normal situation, because you know, if, if, if R was smaller than G, then it means that you will need to reinvest even more than the return to your capital in order to ensure that your capital grows as fast as the size of the economy, which would be really stupid. I mean, what's the point of being an owner if you need to reinvest more than the return to your ownership? So this is really the very least you can ask from capital ownership, which is that R is bigger than G. Otherwise, what's the point? So in itself, R bigger than G is not you know, there's no problem with it. It could come with a perfectly egalitarian society, it will be perfect. Now, the problem is that in practice, there are many forces that make wealth uh, unequal. You know, you have many shocks in the life of families and in the process of uh, wealth accumulation and wealth transmission. So, you know, different, different families have different numbers of children. Uh, they die at different age. Uh, uh, some make very good investments, some go bankrupt, some have very high wages, some have low wages. So, and the point is that for a given variance of all these other shocks, a bigger gap between R and G will tend to amplify this variance and will tend to get the economy to converge to a level of wealth concentration that will be a steeply rising function of R bigger than G. So this is the basic theoretical model that I have in mind. This is exposed in a, you know, technical appendix to chapter 10 that's available online, you can have a look. That's exposed in the science paper as well. This is a, a well-known theoretical model, but here I try to take it seriously, which is that a small difference in R bigger than G can indeed magnify other shocks, but you need other shocks. You know, if you don't have all these other shocks to rate of return, to labor income, to demographics, in itself, R bigger than G does not produce inequality. But if you have all these other shocks, then it will tend to magnify inequality. And I think that's part of the explanation for why uh, wealth concentration is so high in pretty much every society up until World War I is, is because of that. In particular, you know, the why is wealth concentrated almost as much or even more in France in 1914 than in France in 1789? which you know, the elite at the time in France did not want to believe. They thought, well, we have uh, you know, modern property, modern growth, uh, equality under property regimes. We are not in the ancien regime anymore, so we should have equality. Well, except that, in fact, the concentration of wealth was just as large as a century and a half before. And I think part of it is because the gap between R and G uh, did not decline because of modern capitalism and because of industrial revolution. Which brings me to the very important question raised by Christine. You know, what's my definition of capitalism? Well, you know, I like your uh, definition. You know, the set of institutions you describe is very important. You know, probably uh, 
Sven will add that the, you know, the development of new appropriation of land uh, in the colonies, in the new world, uh, the invention, or at least the development of slavery at a scale that was unknown before played a big role. So, you know, I think all these different institutions and, and, uh, and, and, and legal institutions and coercive powers, to take the terms of David, are, are, are critical to the development of capitalism. But one of the messages of my book is that in the end, uh, modern uh, capitalist institution and modern industrial revolution did not affect this basic in inequality between the rate of return and the growth rate as much as one might have expected in the long run. So, of course, the growth rate increased from 0% in pre-industrial society to 1% or 2% in the long run in modern industrial societies, but the rate of return also increased. Uh, and so the gap between the two did not, did not change that much. So of course, it depends on the legal regime. The legal rules can affect this gap a lot. So this is not, I don't take it as a as, you know, rule of uh, an act of God. You know, it is a rule of law, and, and, and so this can be changed by different legal regimes. But by and large, this did not, uh, uh, this, you know, this big gap was there before industrial capitalism, and it will probably be there after industrial capitalism. So you have metamorphosis of property structure, but, but this uh, structural relation is still, is still there. Uh, le let me uh, move to the, the questions that were raised after that. Uh, uh, Brazil, uh, is, you know, do you have the same policy recommendations for Brazil than for uh, you know, uh, uh, the US or France? You know, I think, no, each, each country has its own set of institution and policy to develop. Each country has its own uh, um, uh, particular intimate history of uh, inequality. So Brazil, of course, is a, is a country with a, a lot of inequality, which a lot of it comes from its particular history. You know, this was the last country where uh, slavery was abolished. There was, you know, one third of the population that was slave in uh, 1880 as compared to 10% in the US. So the, the slavery took a dimension. So there are historical roots to inequalities that are different in different countries. Now, still, some of the solutions that, that I mentioned in the book, I think, can be of interest, you know, even if each country has to find its own way. In terms of progressive taxation, you know, Brazil is a country where you have very large indirect tax, um, um, consumption tax, so, you know, you pay, uh, you, you pay to, when you pay your electricity bill, you pay a 30% tax. Uh, but then, uh, if you, the, the inheritance tax right now in Brazil is three percent, so you know if you inherit millions of, uh, of uh, tens of millions, you know you pay a three percent tax, and you know I think probably you could reduce the first one and increase the second one. Or, uh, so, so there are issues about. Um, uh, uh, taxation in order to finance better public services, uh, public education in Brazil, where you know I think there are things to learn from other other countries, but that, you know, that doesn't mean that there's a one-size-fits-all uh, uh, policy. Um, I will skip the, the dinner questions because it's, uh, you know, the, you know I, I, I don't quite know what to, what to answer to, to this, but, uh, 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 you know, Jesus Christ would have been, uh, but, uh, um, anyway, uh, so the, 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 la the last question, oh, I'm sorry that I did not uh, uh, keep track, yes, progressive taxation and innovation. You know, the, the historical evidence uh, is that, you know, it really depends how you structure your, your, uh, your level of progressivity. You know, if you had very high tax rate on everybody, including people who are just starting new accumulation of wealth, then that's probably not good for innovation. But if you have very high progressivity only at the very top end, uh, you know, the evidence in particular from this country in the US, you know, in, in the US, this is a country where between 1930 and 1980, on average, the, the top income tax rate was 82%, which is really as high as it can possibly be. Well, there was state income tax in addition to that. Uh, but this applied to very high income levels, typically above $1 million in annual incomes. And, uh, you know, if anything, the productivity growth of the US economy, uh, well, apparently this didn't kill American capitalism, otherwise we would have noticed it, you know, in 50 year, in a 50 year period. And, and if anything, productivity growth was higher in the 50s, 60s, 70s than what it has been since the Reagan years. Probably because uh, paying top managers uh, 
uh, as I say during my talk, 10 million dollars per year rather than 1 million, you know, it's not so useful. And, and so, uh, I, you know, I think the evidence is that, uh, you know, of course, if you have 80 percent tax rate on anybody who's making uh, uh, 100 or 200,000 dollars, probably you would have a different effect. So it, it really depends how you structure your, uh, your, uh, your progressive uh, uh, tax system. Okay, let's take two more questions, very short, and then we'll unfortunately have to come to an end. Okay. Hello, Professor Piketty. My question is uh, also pretty connected to that uh, uh, case of uh, endogenous growth that uh, was the previous question about. Have you tried to estimate in some way uh, what part of the change in uh, the net worth of uh, the richest individuals uh, came either from buying new assets, change of prices of assets they already have, or from creating entirely new kinds of assets, like, for example, building a cell phone network in Mexico. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. If a capital tax were to be imposed, then if somebody owns assets which do not produce cash flow, does that mean that that person would have to sell assets in order to pay the taxes? And would this lead to a market crash in that case? Thank you. Hmm. Well, you know, just to, to start with the, the last question, the, the property tax, there is already a wealth tax in the US and in most countries. This is called the property tax. It's just that it's, uh, it's based only on real estate property. Uh, but this is already half of household wealth. So this is half of a wealth tax, if you want. And, and I think, the, you know, the main reason why it's, it's half of a wealth tax is because this was created uh, a long time ago, 200 years ago, like in, in, in the US or actually in, in Britain or in France, you know, tax foncière, which is the equivalent of the property tax, was created by the revolution at a time where wealth was mostly either land or real estate and there was limited financial uh, wealth and, and financial uh, liability. So that's why this tax was created as a tax on real property. Uh, but. Uh, uh, the way it works is that indeed if you have a lot of property but you don't get any income out of it, so you know if you have uh, you have uh, uh, secondary residence in every everywhere in the country but you don't rent them, you don't do anything with them and you just spend one night per, uh, per month in each of them, then your property tax will be more than your income. You know, in the extreme case where you have zero, zero income and, and you have property tax. And so, yes, you will have to sell some of your property to pay your property tax. But I, I don't think anybody is asking that such people should be exempt from property tax. I, I've never heard this, this uh, you know, anybody asking for this. So I think the whole point of a property tax or wealth tax is that, you know, indeed, if you have a lot of wealth but very little income and you're just seated on your property, then, well, you will have to sell some of it so that other people who know what to do with the wealth will do something with it. And that's the whole logic of property taxation. It's always been like this. So that's why, you know, this issue of how much you should tax the stock of property versus the flow of new income is a complicated... Uh, it's not... Um, you know, in, 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 in France, a big proponent of uh, wealth taxation was Maurice Allais, who was a Nobel Prize winner in economics. And I can tell you, he was not left-wing at all. He was a very right-wing person. But he thought that we should tax the stock of property and not at all the income flow so as to put incentives on people to get a return on their property. Now, it's, it's too extreme because sometimes, you know, the rate of return you get is just... Uh, partly due to bad luck. So if you are a company, you're making losses. Uh, maybe, you know, if you, if you keep paying a tax on your stock of wealth, you will pay as much tax as a company making huge profits, which maybe will put you in bankruptcy. So that's probably not a good idea. So you want to find a balance between how much you tax the stock and how much you tax the flow. And, uh, you know, each tax system has components of the two. The problem is that sometimes these tax systems were uh, set up uh, 200 years ago and did not adapt to the structure of wealth today. But, uh, you know, I think we, we both, both kind of taxation are useful. We have to find the right, uh, the right balance. Okay, and on this note, unfortunately, we have to come to an end, not least before, because Professor Piketty is going to have to give another talk in uh, 45 minutes uh, elsewhere in Boston. But, uh, but we could go on, obviously, for much longer. And in some ways, we should go on for much longer. This should uh, be an invitation to continue to d this debate on, uh, on these issues. And we should thank uh, Professor Piketty not just for being here, which, of course, we thank you for very much, but also for instigating this really important debate. And thank you for joining us today. Pleasure to meet you. Very nice to meet you.